Okay, so for the second part of the theory section uh, of the second lecture, uh, the first part of speech that I'm going to talk about in more detail uh, is nouns. Okay, uh, Nouns are pretty simple in English, as you should know. We can divide nouns in a few ways. Uh, we can divide nouns into common nouns and proper nouns. Okay, so proper nouns are names of things, and common nouns, uh, that, that sounds, <laughs> common nouns are, are words which we use to describe items, of which there are many, such as table, chair, and so on, and proper nouns are the names of individuals, so individual people or individual places, uh, that kind of thing, not, not general nouns, okay. We can also dis, uh, dis divide uh, nouns into abstract nouns and concrete nouns okay so concrete nouns referring to things which actually exist which we can see and touch and abstract nouns referring to ideas to notions uh, to anything that's that's not real in this way okay um, but again that's that's not uh, a very difficult uh, distinction i think and finally, we, we can divide nouns into countable nouns and uncountable or non-count nouns, uh, which again is something which you have come across in your practical English classes, uh, that there are nouns like, for example, accommodation, furniture, uh, which are not usually countable in English. So not countable means we can't say a or an, we don't have a furniture or an accommodation usually if we're talking about somewhere to stay however the word accommodation can also mean uh, agreement something like that in which case it can be countable so you have to be careful um, and also that we don't use plurals okay so uh, we don't talk about furnitures uh, however again you have to as I said be careful because English being endlessly flexible as it is uh, most nouns which are considered not countable can sometimes be used in a countable fashion right so we have nouns like fruit where we don't use fruit in a countable fashion about pieces of fruit right you can't say i have three fruits on the table if they're all bananas however if you have a banana an apple and an orange on the table you can say i have three fruits on the table because there are three types of fruit so this is something which is true of, of uh, most of the countable nouns or non-countable nouns connected with food. Also, we have examples, we say something like coffee is not countable, uh, but then we order three coffees, by which we mean three cups of coffee, and we're simply missing out cup. And then coffee uh, comes to be used to mean a cup of coffee, uh, and so it is used in a countable fashion. So this distinction between countable and non-countable can be a little bit blurred, can be a little bit confusing. The most important thing is not to think that a particular word is always, at every instance, going to be countable or uncountable. There are even some surprising ones, like it, it seems like an, an easy one that in English money is not countable, at least as, as a word. Um, but in fact, the word monies is actually quite common in legal English, in slightly old fashioned English, uh, without really any great change of meaning. Um, but it is often used in, in the plural form, so you have to be a little bit careful with that. Uh, obviously, with, in English, gender is not a big problem with nouns. Um, there are certain words which are considered uh, to refer to feminine things, and we'll see an example of that in, uh, in the exercises which follow. So I won't say any more about that at the moment. We'll, you'll, you'll see when we get to that. But generally, of course, we, we don't have grammatical gender, so that's not a problem. Uh, what else is there? Well, the other two things which uh, we need to think about are things which are going to feature in the exercises. So one of them is, is uh, plurals. We're not interested here too much in irregular formation of plurals. Again, that's a question for practical English. Uh, you should know, you know words like feet. I mean, th this, this, is, this is basic stuff. Um, but there can be a certain flexibility in English, over, particularly in British English, over the um, plurality or not 
of noun forms when it comes to agreement with verbs. Okay, so any noun which refers to a group of people uh, or a group of other things, but usually it's people, can, uh, even though it's in a singular form, can take plural verb forms in English, uh, so it can be understood plurally. Okay, and again, there are not really any rules necessarily. Well, there is a rule, but there's, there's not a rule that you can take a particular word and see that it's always going to be used in a particular way. We can say, for example, in, in British English, uh, a word which refers to a sports team will always be treated plurally, even though it appears to be singular. Okay, And that is true whether it's the name of a, a team or whether it's simply the name of the place. Okay, So you can have, uh, for example, a football team that's not the name of a place, right? So you can, uh, there aren't very many actually <laughs> football teams that aren't the names of places, but uh, let's take, take something like Aston Villa, which is not really known as a, as a place. So this is a team from Birmingham in England, right? But we would still say, we would say Aston Villa are. Uh, but we would also say Birmingham are, okay? We do this also with national teams. So we would say England are winning, Poland are losing, something like that. Uh, we would never say is if we are talking about a team. When we say Poland is, we're talking about the country. When we say Poland are, we're talking about the team, okay? This is a peculiarity of British English. In America and Australia, they don't do it like that. Uh, so, for example, during the, uh, during the summer when England are playing cricket, they usually have commentaries which feature commentators from the countries they're playing against. So very often this is Australia or New Zealand. And then you have a, a mixture of usages by the commentators. So the Australian commentator will say, Australia is... 300 for two, for example, and the British commentators will say, and England are 200 for six, something like that. You, I don't expect you to understand cricket scores. The point being that uh, this, is a, this is something which is done in British English. What adds to the confusion with sports teams is that in Australia and in America, sports teams uh, almost always have, maybe always, have plural names. If you think of, of famous American sports teams, you've got things like the Giants. Uh, who else? Every every uh, Los Angeles Raiders used to. Be, I don't know if all the teams are still the same. The Jets, the Knicks. Uh, all of the American sports teams are pluralized, which means that they use uh, plural verbs with them. Uh, however, when they then refer to a sports team which is not pluralized, Americans would switch back to using singular verbs. This is something which upsets sports fans in, in Britain, um, since several of the major football teams in England are owned by Americans, and when the American owners make a statement, they say things like, Liverpool is a great football club, and all the fans think, mm, that's not how we say it, as we say, Liverpool are, Liverpool is a city, Liverpool are a football club. Okay. Uh, so that's one thing about sports teams, but this spreads further into all sorts of groups. So we say things like, my class are nice people. Um, and then there is a difference between my class is and my class are. If we say my class is, we're thinking about this sort of institutional notion of this class. Whereas when we say uh, my class are, we're thinking about the people in the class. Okay. The same thing happens uh, very commonly with the word government. Government is... Uh, a noun which is very often used in the singular and very often used in the plural. And there is a big difference in meaning. Uh, when we talk about government and we say the government are, then we are referring to the prime minister and the other ministers who are currently in office. Okay, So we talk about how the government are handling the current crisis. Okay, But when we use the government in a singular form, we're much more talking about government as an institution and indeed the whole of the sense of authority in the country. Okay, um, What the government does uh, can 
in some senses refer to, to the law generally, it can refer to the whole of parliament, it can even refer to as authority in the sense of the police and all of the different uh, institutions which are connected with law enforcement. Okay, so we'll see some examples of that in a moment. The second thing uh, we need to talk about is the formation of uh, genitive forms in English. Genitive forms in English are very interesting because we have two ways of doing it. Okay, we can make genitives with of or we can make genitives with possessive s, um, which gives us good flexibility. The first thing to say is that every single word can be done in both ways. Uh, however, there are conventions about which way is preferred. Okay, uh, the simplest of those conventions is that with people we tend to use possessive s, with objects and institutions we tend to use of. Okay, so we talk about the University of Oxford, we don't say Oxford's University. Okay, but that doesn't mean that we can't, right? We can, we just generally don't. Uh, this, this rule is not, as I said, is, is not a fixed rule and it's not like if you say the table's leg, it's going to be wrong and you should say the leg of the table. Um, it's just that it it's, sounds a little odd to say the table's leg. And that introduces actually the third possibility, which is something uh, when you're translating into English that you really need to, to be careful with, which is that very often instead of a genitive form, English users would simply use the noun form itself uh, as a modifier to the second noun. So in fact, we certainly wouldn't say the table's leg, but normally we wouldn't say the leg of the table either. We would say the table leg. Okay. So in the same way that we can say the University of Oxford, but we can also say Oxford University. Very, very often English would prefer to simply use the basic noun form to modify the second noun rather than to use a genitive form. Okay, so you need to be careful about that. There's something similar to, to uh, what I was saying about plurals in that sometimes if you use the of form it, about particular uh, nouns such as, such as university, um, something of the university. So if you say the staff of the university, uh, you're using university in an institutional kind of sense. Um, whereas if you you say um, the university's greatest people, okay, then you're using the word university with the with, with the um, possessive s. You're using it more to mean a collection of people rather than a rather than a large institution. Okay, so so there is also this difference that to stress the fact that something is made up of people, you can use the apostrophe s ending. Okay. The third, the final consideration with that is sound and style. Uh, so we will see in the examples that we're going to look at in a moment that there are certain words uh, which don't sound very good with apostrophe s. Uh, and they, therefore it's better to use of. Uh, and generally the, the, the apostrophe S can make things seem a little more familiar, a little more friendly, a little more, more personal. And sometimes you want that and sometimes you don't want that. Okay. All right. So that's enough about the, the general theory. I'll stop there and uh, then we will look at the exercises. Okay. And that will be the end of lecture two.